and welcome everybody here in Twitch chats and everybody on YouTube for our special throne uh Theros Beyond Death, not Throne of Eldraine. Theros Beyond Death uh complete set review. We're gonna be going through all 250 cards in Theros Beyond Death and give an in-depth analysis on how they could they could be used in standard and what kind of impact they can have on the format. So uh, we may even talk, you know, now that we have Historic as a, a new format, we may even talk a little bit about Historic with some of the cards. But yeah, we're going to be going through each and every card for Theros Beyond Death. Uh, let me kind of update something here. There we go. Um, we'll be breaking it down into colors. So for those of y'all watching on YouTube, we're going to start with white. And then, uh, as you can see up here at the top, there's our, our order. We're going to do white, then blue, then black, red, green, and then the multicolor and artifacts. We'll put those all together. Uh, we'll be giving each one a letter grade, A through D or limited. So we're gonna have, so they could get five total uh, letter grades. And you know, we could give like A plus, A minus, you know, B plus, B minus kind of thing. Like if we think it's kind of in between them, but I'll break that down. Also, I'll, um, if you wanna, if you're here in chat, you can do exclamation point grade to get to the grading scale and, um, and the, the Google document that has all of it. I'll put it in the YouTube comments, uh, or sorry, in the just the description. Uh, it'll be linked there. And we'll also kind of do like the, the best five cards in the color. All right, so our the, how our grades are gonna be. So an A, an A is a card that's gonna see a lot of standard play in multiple decks, or be the defining card in a popular deck, or also an incredibly popular sideboard card. Um, so examples could be like Questing Beast, Murderous Rider, Bone Crusher Giant. Um, so basically cards that you're going to see a lot of in standard and cards that you're thinking about whenever you're building your own decks. You know, like maybe you want to play more X3s because they won't die to Bone Crusher Giant and so on. All right, a B is a card. They'll see a good amount of standard play in a support role. Um, also a moderately played sideboard card. So an example of a B from the last set would be like Torbrand, Torbran, Thrain of the Redfell. You know, it sees a modern amount of play. You know, it doesn't doesn't get played in a lot of different decks, but you know, like Mono Red, it's, it's in there. Uh, Realm Cloak Giant or Foulmire Knight, a good support card there. All right, C's are fringe sideboard cards used as filler for certain decks or a playable but, but kind of a build-around card. Also a narrow but still regularly use cyborg card. So some examples there from C's from the last set would be Claim the Firstborn, Outlaw's Merriment, or Epic Downfall. So you know, like that level for C's. Um, so basically A, B's, and C's, you're going to expect to see those cards in standard. You know, C's a little less. Uh, so D's are cards that you rarely see in standard, but they can fill a role for a fringe deck or maybe a fringe cyborg card. So some examples there would be like Cauldron of Eternity, Surfair and the Henge Hammer, Witch's Vengeance. You know, like they're cards that you'll see pop up in standard every now and again, but not something that you play against regularly. And then um, the last uh, rating is just an L for limited. And so these are cards that you really shouldn't see in standard at all. Um, and those are basically for the limited rating. I'm only giving them to, uh, or I guess, I guess, no, we're getting them to all. I did it for a little bit where I only gave it to comments and uncommons, but now we'll give those to rares also. So basically cards that you just shouldn't really see in standard, those get the L4 limited rating. Okay. Um, yeah, as far as, I have a couple of questions here. Um, as far as the last set, uh, I definitely had, you know, Oko and Questing Beast. Like Questing Beast was super obvious, but even Oko, I was like, how, how is this a card? But I did underrate, like I, I was certainly right about those cards i did underrate the adventure creatures i didn't realize how good like the instant and, and uh, sorcery part and then having the creature in the back end I, I did underrate those um and so yeah i had underrated the adventure stuff and so i definitely underrated like edge rolling keeper and um <clears throat> and uh, lucky clover as well i underrated those um just like i i kind of underrated the uh risen reef and the range of elementals from the time before that uh, no, won't be touching on Pioneer at all. No, nope. um, no, yeah, I just I only do I only play like Arena anyway, so I, I just don't even play Pioneer. So I, I wouldn't really be anybody good to talk about it. Um, yeah, it's it's basically just standard. Yeah, we're doing a standard review. 
Uh, but yeah, no, I know, I know, like it, it is a long review because you know we're gonna be talking about all the cards in depth. Um, this set, though, to be to be honest, I've been just, I've had just a really, really busy month, and I honestly have not been able to really read through the cards like I have the last couple of sets. So I'm definitely underprepared this set as a like compared to other sets. So this is definitely going to be more of like a first reaction type thing, um, more so than than previous sets. I don't think that there's a another like Risen Reef or Edgewall Innkeeper in this set. The, both of those cards were were previewed really really late, but they were just like you know throw basically draw a card onto um, synergies like only in the set. As far as I know, there's not a card like that in this one, but you know we'll see. Um. Yeah, we're gonna ha yes. There is an Excel spreadsheet. You can type grade to to find it. Um, yeah, showing up to class without your homework. Yeah, that that's what this kind of is like. So so you know that's what, we got the chat up on the screen. So y'all on YouTube can kind of can see what everybody's saying in chat also um, about the cards. Um, oh, one of them that I was really right about last time was Gadwick. I everybody in chat did not think that Gadwick was gonna be that great, and I was like, no, Gadwick's awesome. But anyway. Um, is it Euro basically Risen Reef? Uh, no, not really. No, it's not like a synergy card like Risen Reef. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully, chat, hopefully y'all did your homework. All right. Well, let's get started. Um, so our first card, All Seed of Life's Bounty. So it's a, a white for a 1-1 one, one lifelink. Pay one, sacrifice All Seed of Life's Bounty. Target creature or enchantment you control gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn. So I like this card. So one thing that it really has going for it is that it is an, env an enchantment creature. And like while that can be a downside, because that means it's going to die to enchantment removal, that that's the downside there. I think that being an enchantment is probably an upside overall in uh, Theros, because there are a good amount of cards that care about enchantments of like, uh, you know, searching for enchantments in the library or, you know, looking at the top whatever cards, grab an enchantment kind of thing, you know, play enchantments, draw cards, I don't know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just a, a little 1-1 one, one for one creature. That's not spectacular. You know, like we've kind of determined that that uh, a creature like that, I mean, especially if there's like, you know, Cauldron Familiar around, you really don't want to have the one toughness if you can avoid it. But that ability is really nice. Uh, give a creature or an enchantment. You know, you can protect like a Banishing Light. Um, yeah, give something protection from the color of your choice. You know, that's that's pretty nice. You do, of course, so basically you have, like, God's Willing on a stick. Um, so, yeah, it looks like everybody, looks like a lot of people are kind of in that, that CC plus range, and that's that's where I'm kind of seeing this, too. I think it's probably a little bit better than a C, but I don't think this is really quite on a B level. But this does have, like, the upside of being, I think, of being, like, a Foulmire Knight. You know, I, I de you know, Foulmire Knight's a B. I could definitely see this being that level if there's enough like engine cards for enchantments uh, and enchantment creatures um so i think it has the potential to probably be on par with like file modern knight to be a b but let's give it a c plus i like i like that rating that a lot of people have let's give this a c plus so i'll write this down c plus okay um archon of falling stars i'll um, I guess I'll try to have like my cursor. I'll have my cursor like above whatever card we're talking about, um, uh, to you know, for the people on YouTube to kind of help. Like, what what card are we talking about? This one right here. So Archon of Falling Stars, four white, white, four, four. So six mana, four, four flyer. Whenever it dies, you may return enchantment card from your graveyard to the battlefield. That looks like a very good, solid, limited card. I don't think this will see any standard play. I don't think it really should uh, see any standard play, except for if, for some reason, if there is, like, some enchantment card that costs a whole lot of mana that whenever, you know, you want this thing to die, you want to have, like, a sacrifice outlet, you want to reanimate your enchantment kind of thing. Um, but six mana, like, if, obviously, if this costs less, like, the ability is pretty sweet. If this costs less, um, uh then it uh it could um maybe ray chan ray chan says will you update your review for previous cards based on cards we see later i, I could see us maybe doing that yeah if we if we get there and there it seems like we need to update something yeah we can do that 
Um, you know, it's not not set in stone. This is only just a C plus now kind of thing. But yeah, we could do that. All right, but anyway, yeah. So let's. I'm gonna give this an L for limited. I don't. I don't think it's more, but it's kind of like an L plus. Like I, you know, like that. If you have like a bunch of really expensive enchantments and that returning to the battlefield, like that's that's pretty sweet. That goes back to the battlefield. But come on, I mean, like look at the great six mana planeswalkers that we see that we have in standard and how much play they see. Like it's six mana. That's tough. All right, we got Archon of Sun's Grace. Two white white for a three four um flying lifelink creature. And it says Pegasus creatures you control have lifelink. And then Constellation, whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, create a two two white Pegasus creature token with flying. Alright, so first let's talk about the body. So first we got a four mana, three four flying lifelink. That's good. Like that's that's a good size. Um, you know, three four, like a couple of things that um uh <laughs> no, siege breaker yeah we had we had some setup time um yeah definitely great for pegasus tribal that's for sure um a couple of bad things about a three four you know it doesn't match up well against questing beast which is you know that's obviously like kind of just a test as far as mid-range creatures go you know like your your three four doesn't match up against theirs but of course it has lifelink so that's good um and then uh, obviously there's the new i know there's like a new red sweeper that does four damage to everything so four toughness is a little rough there but still, with those being said, a 3-4 is still in, in a pretty good spot um, as far as, like, defense against red decks, uh, especially, again, you know, against aggro decks. Uh, there's a lot of, like, 3-1s and 3-2s and stuff like that. Um, and then you have the whenever enchantment enters the battlefield, make a 2-2. Two -two. That's obviously going to be, like, the big thing, you know, right? Like, if you can keep this thing out there, gain some life with attacking with it in the air, being a lifelink creature, maybe you don't have to block and risk it dying, Um each enchantment that you play get it, you know brings along a two two. So this would be re really help out things with like Owl Seed of Life's Bounty and things like that. Um, don't forget the Archon from Eldrine, Eldrain, Pegasus, and Archon at Tribal. Here we come. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I like this card. Uh, you, obviously, it's it's pretty like are you like how much are we really playing this card if we're not playing it in an enchantment heavy deck? You know that's that's kind of like really the question. Um, are you just going to put this in, in other just random white mid-range decks? Are there even white mid-range decks? Is that even a thing? Um, maybe, you know, maybe a cyborg card against aggro. You know, that could be something. Could, could like a control deck, you know, blue-eye control. Can blue-eye control just bring this in out of their sideboard? You know, maybe blue-eye control is playing a bunch of banishing lights, um, and, you know, that kind of stuff, prison realm. And they're just playing like those kind of enchantments, and maybe they just bring in Archon of Sun's Grace out of the sideboard against aggro that they take out their removal. That could be a thing too. Um, I, so I, I could definitely see the Archon seeing some play there too. So overall, uh, when we kind of add those together, um, I kind of feel like this is like a B, like a card they'll see a good amount of standard play in a support role. Um, you know, it will it see as much as like Torbrand or, or Realm Cloak Giant. You know, basically kind of thinking of like the Realm Cloak Giant kind of role like yeah I, I could kind of see that um i like it so i'm gonna let's go with a b here you think a b is too high strong c we'll see i mean i i basically i think that it's just it's just something that's not it's not um married to being a constellation card i think that it being a lifelink creature it can make some other lifelink creatures even if you don't you know maybe you don't have very many of that but Still a pretty good card. <laughs> Would I play white in standard though? Yeah, I mean, who knows? <laughs> Not married, certainly engaged. <clears throat> All right, banishing light. Um, I think I think this is just a, a solid B. I mean, this is just a, a removal spell that um, is going to see a lot of, well, a decent amount of standard play. Um, so it's basically Prison Realm, you know, when it enters the battlefield, exile target, non-land permanent, opponent controls until Banishing Light leaves the battlefield. Except for it's, it's got, it's got a couple of things. One, it does not scry one like Banishing or like uh, Prison Realm does. So that's, that's kind of rough. You don't get to scry one. The scry one's really nice with, with Prison Realm. But instead you get to exile any non-land permanent. Prison Realm only would get rid of, um, creatures and planeswalkers so this gets rid of anything so this gets your witch's oven this gets your um uh trail of crumbs you know but then other you know you can exile your opponent's banishing light with this 
you know, anything like that. And obviously there's going to be a good amount of enchantments in the set. So I like it quite a bit. I like it quite a bit. So y'all are saying, ooh, maybe an A. So yeah, maybe, maybe a B is a little low. I could, I could see going, I can see B being a little low. All right, we'll go B plus. We'll go B plus. We'll do that. All right, updating it, B plus. Okay. That's fair, that's fair. <clears throat> so yeah, it's it is it's one less mana than Conclave Tribunal and has no convoke. Um is it better than Conclave? It depends. If you're playing a lot of creatures, you probably want like if you're playing a lot of creatures and you're going wide, you'd rather have Conclave Tribunal. But if you're if you're not playing a lot of creatures, you'd rather have Banishing Light. Because even if you're playing like just a just a few creatures, you may your creatures are probably pretty valuable where you don't really want to be tapping your creature for mana like if you only have like one creature or so so it kind of depends if if you're a go wide deck still go with conclave tribunal but for most like mid-range decks that start at like two mana creatures and have val valuable creatures and probably rather play banishing light all right our next card the birth of melitus melitus let me help me with this pronunciation probably probably melitus Melitus, yeah, Mel it's probably Melitus. Um. All right, so this is a saga. All right, two mana, one, chapter one. Search your library for a basic planes, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Okay, so it's basically so it's so chapter one is draw a card, but the card that you're drawing is you know probably the weakest card in your deck. However, sometimes you maybe need that planes. You know, you can maybe play, like, a little less land, so if you have more Birth of Miletuses. Uh, Miletus? Miletus. I guess. Um, anyway, so that's the first chapter. Chapter 2, create an O4 colorless wall artifact creature token with Defender. That's not very valuable. That is really not very valuable. Chapter three, you gain two life. Also, not very valuable. Not very valuable either. Okay, so basically we're spending two mana and over three turns we get to, you know, replace itself, make an 04 and gain two life. Nothing, like it's not, that's not terrible. I mean, you do replace itself, but I mean, we're talking about how good the cards are in standard and... I'm going to just go ahead and give this an L for a limited rating. Because while this isn't, like, terrible, um, yeah, th this would be an anti-aggro card. Yeah, this would be, like, a controlled card against aggro, but still rather just have a removal spell, I think. Because the 04 isn't going to be trading with anything. The 2 life, if you're not if you're not really trading with stuff, you're going to, like, they can do more damage than that. <clears throat> um... Thanks, QQ. All right, uh, Captivating Unicorn. Four and a white for a 4-4 four, four with Constellation. Which, over here. Whenever uh, an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, tap target creature and opponent controls. Well, it's cool art. I mean, that's a cool-looking unicorn. Um, it kind of looks like those My Little Pony sleeves they had. But that's a classic L. That's just a limited card. For a five mana card, and you know, like that's that's just for limited. That's not really for standard. All right, so commanding presence, three and a white for an enchantment. So it's an aura, enchant creature. Enchant creature gets plus two, plus two. Hey, Karam, thank you so much for the fourth month resub. Happy, to keep... thank you, thank you so much, there, Karam. All right, uh, so yeah, so it's an enchantment aura. Enchant creature gets plus two, plus two, and has first strike. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, create a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token. You would really have to have an enchant-heavy deck for this. Um, like where, you know, you really have to have like a, a Bogles-type deck, like where you're trying to Voltron up one creature and enchant it with a whole bunch of things for you to even consider this. I mean, it's just four mana. This isn't... I'm, we're just going to go with an L here. I mean... Yeah, I think this is just just an L. I mean, that's that's where you'd have to like consider it, but... 
still four mana is so much mana. Um, yeah. All right. Um, Don Evangel. Evangel? Probably Evangel. <laughs> Subscription beyond death. <laughs> Thank you so much there. Give me some grief. All right, we got three and a white. There we go. Our six of the day. Three and a white, two, three. Whenever a creature dies, if an aura you controlled was attached to it, return target creature with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard to your hand. Okay, so it's an enchantment creature. So you need so you need to be playing you want to be playing a lot of creatures with CMC two or less. And you also want to be playing auras, and you want to, so you can attach them to creatures. And then whenever any creature dies, if it had the aura attached, then you find your creature with two or less, and you put it back from your graveyard to your hand. Seems like we're jumping through a whole lot of hoops to try to make a three mana two three playable. It does have like a little bit of bonuses with being an enchantment creature, everything like that. But this seems like way too many hoops. Um, I mean, is there a greater promise than the glory of the sunrise? I don't know. That's a good. That's a good existential question, I guess. There, Don Evangel. But, um. So okay, so y'all are saying triggers on dead weight, but dead weight's not in standard anymore, right? Wasn't unless it was reprinted. Was dead weight like reprinted or something? Um. I'm, wasn't dead weight like. Uh, Dominaria. Oh, it was in Guilds of Ravnica. Oh, so it isn't standard. Never mind. I thought it was Dominaria. <clears throat> My bad. Yep. Okay, so you want to play this, and you want to play dead weights, and then you want to play two drops, and then once you, if they have a small creature, and you get to dead weight it, then you get it back. All right. Yeah. I mean, you could see this thing in standard. All right. We'll we'll go with the D. You know, like a Surf Aaron, the Henchhammer kind of thing you know like a, a card that you could run into in standard all right fine we'll go we'll go d here classic d daxos blessed by the sun last time daxos was really good so let's see if daxos is still pretty good this is a legendary enchantment creature demigod so that's pretty sweet it's a demigod um anyway white white for a two star daxos's toughness is equal to your devotion to white so Daxos by himself starts out as a 2-2 two -two with the star, um, which can only just grow from there. Whenever another creature you control enters the battlefield or dies, you gain a life. All right, so more life gain triggers. Um, I mean, there's the the impassioned orat orator. That's a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two that the creatures enter the battlefield, you gain a life. So this now triggers a... If they die also, of course, it's only your creatures, not your opponent's creatures, and it can be bigger. And it's an enchantment for, for that kind of stuff. It's a legend for legend matters things in historic. All that, I don't expect to see a lot of play, but it's going to see a little bit of play. Um, yeah, like the, the, like, yeah, you just see like the life gain cards kind of around. Um, so this is like a C, a C. A fringe standard card used as filler for certain decks. Yeah, that, that kind of sounds like what, what we got going on here with Daxos. I'm going to give Daxos a C. I don't think that um, Daxos is too powerful. I don't I don't expect da you to see Daxos in, like, top-tier decks. Um, but, you know, maybe there is other things that, that get it, gets it there. But I'm going to go with a C there for Daxos. Daxos enables Heliod pretty good. All right. Um... Maybe it does. We'll have to, whenever we get to Heliod, we'll maybe maybe change the rating there. Do you think the life gain package will be B tier? Okay, maybe maybe it will be. It, it's not traditionally, but, you know, maybe with, you know, we'll see with Heliod and all that kind of stuff. We'll see. All right, Daybreak Chimera. Three white white for a 3-3. Three, three. This spell costs X less to cast, where X is your devotion to white. So if you have three devotion to white you can play it as a two mana three three flyer which two mana three three flyers are certainly playable um, that's like a, a later on time of the game for a a three three flyer i mean if you if you go daxos on turn two then you can play chimera on turn three so it's just a three mana three three if you want to curve daxos into daybreak chimera 
Who knows? That's that's not a bad curve. That's not a bad curve at all. Um, good, good and popper. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Let's go with a D minus, or maybe even a D. I could I could see. I mean, honestly, this this seems like maybe a better card than this Don Evangel, or at least close to it. I'll, let's, I'll go with a D as well. I could see. I could see seeing some Daybreak Camaro play. That could happen. Oh, some people are going with C for a, a mono white formation deck. Yeah, I mean, if you know you throw out a bunch of stuff out there, three three flying body is not bad. It's just is that better than other options? That's the thing. Um, maybe that's not. It. So it's not bad. I'll go with the D though. All right, dreadful apathy. That that's one. That one. The de yeah. That's that's one that definitely has higher upside. You know, like that, that could, like, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be too surprised if this gets, this shows up in a highly played deck. This, this card has higher upside. Dreadful Apathy, two and a white enchantment, enchant creature, enchant creature, can't attack or block, and then you can spend a three mana to exile enchanted creature. All right, so you can, um, you know, you just play this as a three mana pacifism, but then you can also spend an extra three mana later on to exile said creature. We're just going to go with an L here. This is a limited um, removal spell. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're playing that in standard. This can only, yeah, this can only exile the creature that you are enchanting with this. You cannot exile any any enchant, enchanted creature at all. Um, only Only the creature that Dreadful Apathy is on. All right, Eidolon of Obstruction, one in a white, two one enchantment creature spirit, with first strike, and loyalty abilities of planeswalkers your opponents control cost one more to activate. Now we're talking. Now we're talking with a two drop that can just kind of fit anywhere and um, probably be more disruptive or impact a game more than Daxos. Like Daxos is a two drop, but you have to have like white, white. So you have to be very white heavy to play Daxos. This is a lot easier to play in different decks. Two, one first strike is, um, you know, that's good stats. Uh, pairs really well with red, with like red damage to help be able to trade up. But yeah, then, then it just um, anno annoy your opponents with their loyalty abilities. If they have, you know, three mana, then they play their three mana to fairy. They don't get to activate. The first turn, you know, they have five mana when they play Nissa. Well, now Nissa, you can't activate Nissa that first turn. That's that's a pretty nice ability. Um, good little hate bear here. This is a good classic hate bear, and it's an enchantment creature for all the reasons that like enchantment creatures can matter. I know, like there's like the um, I need to, like sit over here so that light. But um, yeah, I know there's like the green white planeswalker and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I really like this card. This is definitely a, the kind of card that I like. Um, I like Hate Bears. And so yeah, Eidolon of Obstruction, good card. Um, now, will it, how much standard play we'll see? We're, we're still talking about a, a white two drop. Like comparing this to like Tithe Taker, I think Tithe Taker is going to be more impactful a lot of the time. And, you know, Tithe Taker can leave a body behind. I, um, but I think it's, it's pretty similar to Tithe Taker. And, you know, Tithe Taker isn't, you know, dominating standard or anything like that. Um, so I'm gonna go with a I'm gonna go with a B. I'm gonna go with a B here. A card that let's see a good amount of standard play and a support role. A good solid B for Eidolon of Obstruction. Um, I don't think this is is that good of a sideboard card. I don't think the I don't think this is a sideboard card. I think this is really a main deck card, kind of like Tithe Taker. I don't really like Tithe Taker in the sideboard either. Um, it's just a, a card that's like sideboard sideboard cards. You really want them to have a big impact on the game. You want them to be um, really designed to target certain metagame decks that, that you want to have a big impact on the game. And this is just a, a card that that's not bad against anything, but isn't you know isn't uh, fantastic against anything even a planeswalker heavy deck i mean we're still talking about two one it's easy to kill all right our next card elspeth conquers death three white white for a saga 
Chapter 1. Exile target permanent and opponent controls with CMC cost 3 or greater. So that's very impactful. Any permanent. So we're talking Questing Beast. We're talking Banishing Light. We're talking um, Nissa. You know, any permanent. Now, it's got to be 3 or greater. And so, you know, like they play their big permanent. You play your Elspeth Conqueror's deck death afterwards. And exile it. Just, it's gone. Like that's... That's very useful. <clears throat> this art looks pretty sweet too, though. Anyway, uh, chapter two, your non-creature spells your opponent's cost. Cast two more to cast until your next turn. All right, so you know you, you play it. Let's think about how it works. So you play it, you get to exile something. Um, then they do all their stuff. Then your next turn, boom, chapter two. All right, now your spells cost two more. So now if they want to like, if they held up like counter magic, that's going to cost two more. Um, or more likely, like if you're if you're playing against this card, more likely you're going to be like tapping out because you know that they're going to cost more. But then, whenever you untap for like a turn, your non-creature spells cost two more. Like that's that's not nothing. Like that's but that's something that that if you're playing if you're playing against the card, you can kind of um, you can kind of play around that a little bit. You can plan for it and everything. You know that that's going to be an effect that's going to happen. And then third chapter, return target creature or planeswalker card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Put a plus one plus one counter on it or a put plus one plus one counter or a loyalty counter on it. That's pretty awesome. So yeah, that's basically just like the third chapter of Eldritch Reborn, but you're only getting from your graveyard. You're not getting any graveyard. So you gotta have creatures or planeswalkers over there. So yeah, this is a very similar card to Eldritch Reborn, if if we kind of think of it. Um, the first chapter is better than the Eldritch Reborn's first chapter most of the time. I mean, you get to you get to target what you want to exile as long as there's a target. Sometimes you play Eldritch Reborn and there's not a target for that other part. Um, the second chapter on Eldritch Reborn I like a lot more. I like make your opponent discard more than than that. You know, you're, you're trading with another spell. And then the third chapter on Eldritch Reborn I like I like the third chapter for Eldritch Reborn also better, where you get to choose from either graveyard. Like that's that's certainly better. Um, than just limiting yourself to one graveyard, even though you get an extra plus one, plus one counter or loyalty counter on it. So yeah, I mean, I think the 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 main determining factor for this uh, for this card will be how good the first chapter is and how much, because five mana is, that is a lot. Like we're, we're talking about a large, for standard, that's basically the top of curve. So we're talking about the... Um, we're talking about yeah, like the top of curves, and and that's true. Yeah, De it, these sagas do help your devotion. That is true. I'm I'm probably not I'm not really giving that too much of a uh too much too much of a thought because you know basically everything helps devotion. But that is true. That is that is something that that sagas do as well. Um. So yeah, basically. It's all about that. I think it's going to be all about that first chapter. Um, if you're saying this fits its way into Esper Control, I mean, it kind of depends on their if they have enough creatures and planeswalkers. You know, like if you're playing this in Esper Control, you're certainly going to be playing, you know, like your Narsets and Teferis, like your three mana walkers that that will likely die, and you'll be able to bring back because you know you do want to have a, a target for that third chapter, um, which you won't always have a target for that third chapter, but. Uh... But yeah, like if it, if this if this does see a lot of play, you know, like you're gonna have to kind of build around this, thinking that all right, my permanence like it it um it increases the value of of two mana cards quite a bit, and also just cards that cost three or more that uh, give you a good amount of value as soon as you play them. But anyway, yeah, this is this is a a very good card. Um, I mean, we're still talking about a five mana saga. So if you think about like Eldritch Reborn, like people didn't really play four Eldritch Reborns too much. Like so, it's I don't I this isn't an A for me, even though it can have a, a big impact because I don't think it's just going to be like a, a four of kind of card just because we're talking about a a situational five mana card. Like you still need you know like. Even though the there's a large percentage of games like where you're going to be able to use the first chapter and the third chapter, that doesn't mean it's a hundred percent. So I think this is kind of like just another B, honestly. Um, 
you know, I think this is kind of like a Realm Cloak Giant type level, like would which would be a, a good amount of play in a support role, honestly. As far as like B plus, I don't know, maybe. I could, I could, I mean, I, I could definitely see B plus. I would not do this. Is not a B minus. I could definitely see a B plus. Um. <laughs> yeah, since Elgerborn saw play when standard power level is much smaller than now. <clears throat> okay. Elspeth, Sun's Nemesis. Two white, white. Five loyalty, legendary planeswalker, Elspeth. This is the card that, you know, we've known about for basically a really long time. I'm sure everybody knows this card by now. Um, all three abilities are minus, so minus one up to tar two target creatures. Each get plus two, plus one until end of turn. Minus two, create two, one, one white human soldier creature tokens. And minus three, you gain five life. But then it has escape six, or escape four white, white. Exile four other cards from your graveyard to have Elspeth escape. I, I'm i a pretty big fan of Elspeth's Sun's Nemesis. I like this card. I think that, um, I think it has pretty good play patterns. I like the, you know, it's it's basically all about this minus two. Um, it's all about uh, the minus two, you know, like create two, you know, so you play it, you make two one ones. If they don't kill your Elspeth, you get to just make two more one ones. <clears throat> that doesn't sound like a whole lot, especially for how good sweepers are. Um, but that can be a lot, you know, like it, like that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot of bodies. If you have ways to make to, you know, like obviously there's convoke, there's, um, cards like unbreakable formation, all that kind of stuff. But if you have ways to, to use those extra bodies, um, but then I think that escape is pretty valuable. Also being able to play this, you go minus two, minus two, and then the last turn you can go minus one and then you're all best in your graveyard. Then you can spend your six mana escape, bring it back minus one again or minus two again um, but then also just i think the minus one is pretty underrated plus two plus one for two different creatures that's that's a lot of power you know that's an extra four power that you're attacking that can kill people pretty fast like imagine if you curve out with like a two drop into a three drop and you're playing against like their control opponent where you know they're probably going to wrap the next turn you play elspeth you minus one um you know that's a lot of extra damage there you know if they don't have that wrath uh they're in a whole lot of trouble even if they do then you still get to rebuild it very fast by doing the minus two what's up Zerv? thank you so much i am having a great weekend thanks for resubbing for 32 awesome months um but yeah i think this is a card that that uh i think a lot of people are underrating this card and i think this is a, a really good um planeswalker in standard and i think this is going to see a good amount of play and i think i think it just fits kind of everywhere um i think it can fit in even in control decks with by making blockers gaining life and just being a a like it's something that can just win really long games it can win really long games in control decks because you can just keep bringing it back with the escape clause and you can have like the rest of your deck be interaction and then eventually just keep bringing back Elspeth in, in late games and use Castle Art and Veil and Elspeth to just go wide and just win win late games kind of thing. Um, so why would you play this in a control deck? Because it, it can be a win condition where you don't you don't really have to you know you don't have to play other cards that win the game where this can just be a, a really late game win condition. I think there are definitely decks where you could play a full four of this. Like if you're gonna be a white aggressive deck you can absolutely play the full four of this. I think that I think people really underrate this minus one ability. Um, and of course, control decks, you know, like that minus three of gaining five life is valuable as well. I like Elspeth. I mean, I think this is a really good card. I'm going to go ahead and uh, I think so. As far as an A goes, um, it's certainly this is, in my opinion, this is the best white card that we've seen so far. I'm kind of on like the A to A minus, I think like A minus. Um, but I think basically, I think this is a card that people are going to be surprised about how well it plays. Um, I 
All right, looks like I looks like other people are a lot lower on Elspeth, but you know, we'll see. You know, like it's that's a, that's the great part about it. it's it's tough doing this, but you know, we'll we'll have to just play the games and see. But uh, fun to talk about. <laughs> All right, so we're going A minus. All right, favored of. I guess that I guess one other thing that you know somebody said you fill your graveyard with this card it's awesome yeah that's that's another thing is you don't actually have to cast this you know like you can uh, it can be either discarded or you mill it over that kind of stuff you know it's in your graveyard then you can play it later on so it's like just a it's a free card in your graveyard that's certainly valuable all right favored of Iroas. Two and a white, two two human soldier with constellation. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, favored of Iroas gains a double strike until end of turn. This should just be L for limited. Um, I guess if there is the Voltron type deck, you equip an enchantment to, with this, and now it has double strike. Um, you know that's that's like something that could happen, I suppose. But I'm just going to go ahead and give this an L for limited. Uh, I don't really expect that to. Uh, um, to really be a deck, and you know, we're still talking about three mana, two, two. Um, yeah, so it's yeah, it's like an it's like an L with the potential to be like a D, but I'll go with an L. Flicker of Fate, one in a white, instant exile target creature or enchantment, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. What is that art? That's like a is that like a lizard or something? That's it's a weird face that's going on right here. I don't I don't know what this is. Um, but yeah, so yeah, you exile a creature or enchantment, then return to the battlefield. So yeah, it's Teferi's Time Twist, except for it's worse. It's only creatures and enchantments. I think Teferi's Time Twist was like any non-land permanent. And they also came back with counters and stuff. But yeah, so this is a white flicker. Um, you basically, to be able to play this, you need a lot of spells with ETB effects. I'm going to go ahead and give this a D. I don't think this is just like an L. I, I think like I could see myself putting this into a deck, um, if there's like enough ETB effects that you, that you want to flicker and everything. It's like a centaur. Looks like Woe Strider. Okay. Yeah. Flickering Sagas is pretty cool. That's true. You do get to flicker Sagas. That's pretty cool. And yeah, it saves from targeted removal, but I'm still gonna I still think that's a D. That's still not I don't think that's something that you really you know, like put a bunch of flicker of fates in your deck. It's like you could have like this tricky card that gets them kind of thing. Maybe deep I mean I will go D plus. I guess if if we want to flicker sagas a lot. Alright, we'll go D plus. Not after the last effect. I think like once once the the last chapter, um, part of the you sacrifice it after the, that last chapter. You can, you don't have a time of all right. The third chapter goes, all right, and then and now we're gonna flicker it after the third chapter before it's sacrificed. There's not like a time for you to respond between those. <laughs> HXC. So thanks to the Twitch Prime sub. All right, that's sub number eight. Oh, we need to update this. Um, I mean, I guess if you, if you play it before, like the third chapter is on the stack and then you flicker it, I guess you could do it that, that way. And then does, then the third chapter would still, re cause then, then if you do it that way, then you'd have the first chapter resolve, but then does the third chapter still, does it still happen? Cause it's not in play anymore. I don't, I don't know. Like that's when you'd have to flicker it. I don't know if the third, like I, you know, I just don't know, like the judge ruling there. I don't know if, um, I don't know if it still sees the saga out there and goes to the third chapter if that's something that matters maybe that doesn't matter i don't know how much relevant kaya's ghost form can be now why why is that bertalux okay because you can you can flicker your kaya's ghost form and put it on another creature it seems like you're just playing a whole bunch of like situational cards and just trying like i don't i don't think that that's really yeah, you can flicker a Doom Foretold, but it um, that doesn't really do anything flickering it. You know, it doesn't actually do anything. 
All right, we got Glory Bearers as our next card. Uh, three and a white, three, four. Whenever another creature you control attacks, it gets plus zero, plus one until end of turn. Hmm. This will be an L. Okay, you need to put the counter on the saga according to some rule. Okay, so that doesn't work. L. All right, so here's this Heliod card that a lot of people are talking about. I think for older formats. I'm not sure for standard. Let's see. Two and a white. Five, five. Legendary enchantment creature god. It's indestructible. As long as your devotion to white is less than five, Heliod isn't a creature. Whenever you gain life, put a plus one, plus one counter on a target creature or enchantment you control. Pay one and a white for another target creature gains a lifelink until end of turn. Okay. So if you didn't play with the gods last time in Theros, they mostly act as they they're mostly act as enchantments on the battlefields um sometimes they're creatures when they're creatures you're usually winning um because when they're creatures and they get to attack and block that means you also have a, a really good battlefield position for the most part anyway and they're of course they're awesome at attacking and blocking because they're indestructible um so usually you know they help close out games so um anytime you get to turn them into creatures it's definitely really good but for the most part on the battlefield they act as enchantments but then in but then in as we kind of saw with the adventure creatures in your hand and in your library they are they count as a creature so for things you know so that means you know it's a it's a creature for all the things that say you know grab a creature you know look at the top whatever cards you can reveal a creature put into your hand you know that kind of stuff um you know they don't get to rest all, all that kind of stuff so they they act as creatures everywhere except for the battlefield then the battlefield they act as enchantments for the most part obviously that's not all the time um, so, you know, you have like your Heliod out there. So basically you want the card, you want the card to be still very good as, you know, if you think about it as an enchantment, if it's still very good as an enchantment, then, you know, you got a really strong card because it's definitely like all these cards are definitely, all the gods are definitely really, really good if you have them turned on to be creatures. Um, so, uh, the best God for standard by far, I, d I don't know. I don't know if this is the best god for standard. I mean, we'll we'll kind of go through them, but I don't know. Um, I would be surprised if this is the best god for standard. I guess I'll say that. I I do not expect this to be from from reading it here. Um, but yeah, whenever you gain life, you put a plus one plus one counter on target creature or enchantment you control. That's that's definitely a really that's definitely a sweet ability. Um, we see like you know everybody knows that Johnny's pride mate, right? Like. You, if you play arena, you've played against the Johnny's primate a bunch, you know, like that's probably the most popular like starter deck, um, that, that other people play. And so you can see like whenever, and you, you know how it kind of plays out of like, it's not that difficult to build a deck where you're gaining life and you're putting counters on a Johnny's primate and you're growing it and you're like, okay, well, I'm going to have to deal with this as a Johnny's primate. Now the, the great part about Heliod is it's that same kind of effect, but you get to choose what you want to grow. So you can kind of, um put plus one plus one counters on a variety of creatures and uh and that means that you you get to really make combat as um uh i don't know what's the word as profitable for you as possible and so that's a, that's a really nice effect um for sure and of course this is a three mana card so like you're not really having that much investment for this um, I, you can play Heliod in like that, that effect is, that is definitely a very valuable effect. And that, that means I think you can play Heliod even in, um, decks that don't, don't really have that much life gain. I don't think you have to just play tons and tons of life gain to play Heliod. Um, but yeah, like the more I'm kind of thinking about that and, and, uh, how this is a three mana card, I like it. So Heliod in, in the graveyard also, that's, I, all right. I assume this, this, this would completely work. Um, but, you know, like, it's it's a three-mana creature. It's in your graveyard. Like, let's say they kill your Heliod, make you discard it, whatever. It dies somehow. It's in your graveyard. And you play four-mana Soren, the black-white Soren. You minus three, you can bring back Heliod. I'm pretty sure that works. So that's really cool. Um, and then, you know, you keep your Soren around, and your creatures have lifelink, and you attack, you gain life, you put counters on different stuff. So that's pretty sweet. Um... Yeah, I know the other four. Everybody talks about the other formats with like walking ballista and stuff. I mean, that's I'm not I'm not really gonna get into that, but yeah, I mean that's obviously, um, you know, Heliod's gonna be big in those formats. But 
um, as a combo card. Lord Dotel, thank you so much for that support. Thanks for the uh, Twitch Prime sub there. Um, but yeah, you don't you don't need white devotion for for this for like that ability. Like it's it's basically just like an enchantment on on the battlefield. You know, you just think of it as an enchantment that's that's three mana that's out there that says whenever you gain life, put a one one counter on on a creature or on an enchantment. And the reason why it says or enchantment is so that if you gain life but you don't have any creatures in play, you can still put counters on Heliod at the time. And then of course, yeah, Heliod can give your other creatures life link life link, um, which could work. Like you know that. That's pretty great with Questing Beast, giving Questing Beast lifelink, being able to, you know, hit hit something, um, and you redirect the damage to a Planeswalker. You're gaining life twice. You get to trigger Heliod twice. You put it on a double strike. If you say, like, a, a creature with Ember Cleave, you put you give that creature lifelink. It'll do the first strike damage. You gain life. You put a plus one, plus one counter on that creature, and then you get to do damage again. You can maybe uh, get some people with that. Oh no! I mean, it's in, but in your graveyard, it's a creature. It's just in play, it's not a creature. But so, like, it should. So, Soren should be able to bring it back because in the graveyard, it's a creature. Correct. Devotion always counts itself. Yes, it just looks at your battle. So, devotion. Yeah, if you're kind of new to devotion, devotion looks at your your entire battlefield as a whole. So it says as long as your devotion is less than five, it isn't a creature. Well, you start off with one because Heliod will be on the battlefield whenever you're checking, and so Heliod will have one. So you need four other devotion in play to be able to turn Heliod into a creature. So I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna go with an A here for Heliod. I don't this doesn't seem like a pretty sweet card. Um I don't I don't know. Maybe not A. Maybe A minus. Is this like Questing Beast, Murderous Rider, Bone Crusher Giant level? Maybe not. Maybe not. All right, A minus. Let's go A minus. Correct. Heliod does work with Arcbow, yes. A minus. Um, another question. Do you think monocolor decks are getting more popular? Well, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they, they will be after Theros for sure. non-permanent card correct yeah non-permanent cards i mean devotion devotion is just strictly looking at the permanence in play and how much how many of the symbols that you see in play on the battlefield all right so i'll go a minus there okay you like the a better i, I mean i could definitely see a there <clears throat> yep lands are colorless that's a good good reminder there Okay, uh, Heliod's Intervention, X white white instant. Choose one. Destroy X target artifacts or and or enchantments, or target player gains twice X life. I really like this as a sideboard card. This is exactly what Standard needs right now for Cauldron Familiar, Witch's Oven, Trail of Crumbs. Four mana, destroy Trail of Crumbs and Witch's Oven. Perfect. That is an awesome, awesome sideboard card for that. This isn't a main deck card. I don't think you'll really see this in the main deck, except if artifacts and enchantments become so big that everybody has artifacts and enchantments everywhere, especially enchantments. If they become, you know, like if, if like, you know, three of the top five decks are playing a lot of enchantments, then maybe you could play this in the main deck. But this is, this is a great sideboard card against um, the food decks. And I know they have other cards in the set that are really good against food decks. Um, so I think it's going to be, I think the uh, food decks are really losing a lot with Theros entering. Um, but yeah, this, this is an awesome, awesome sideboard card uh, for what we want. And then, yeah, you can destroy all the enchantment creatures for sure. I still don't think it makes it a main deck card, but, but this kind of card, if this is, you know, a widely played card, it does make playing enchantment creatures and enchantments like expensive sagas, it does make playing those cards less valuable if Heliod's Intervention is a very popular um, sideboard card. Uh, so as far as as far as the grade, hey, what's up, Bonus Factory, saying welcome back. Thank you so much. As far as our grade here, um, so B says, you know, moderately played sideboard card. I think that we're a little bit above that. I mean, it depends. 
if if the food decks kind of die, then I could see this not being that that well played. Actually, so let's let's just go with a B for a moderately played sideboard card because it's the kind of thing that if you need it, it's gonna be good. It's all about it's all about that first ability, destroy target art. The second ability isn't. It's not about that at all. It's all about destroy X target artifacts and or enchantments. Um, yeah, but that's a that's a really really good ability. Yeah, so maybe between A and a B, I mean I, I could definitely see going B plus here a little bit better than a moderately played sideboard card. Yeah, let's let's go with that. Let's go B plus. All right, Heliod's Pilgrim. This is a this is a reprint. I've seen Heliod's Pilgrim before. Two and a white, one, two. When Heliod's Pilgrim enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an aura card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. So I think we're going to go with a D for this card. This is, you know, like if you do want to build a deck around auras, this is a really nice one. I mean, you do get to, um, you know, it is a, um, you know, it is a tutor, which is awesome. Um, you know, you only get aura cards, but yeah, like you get, if there's, you know, an important aura card that you have in your deck, such as, you know, all that glitters, for example, if you have a card like that, that you really want to draw, we're talking about a three mana one, two, that's, that's getting you that card every single time. Um, you know, even as we can see with idyllic tutor in a little bit, this is three mana search your library for an enchantment put into your hand. Like that's, that's kind of like your price for a tutor is three mana to be able to go find whatever card you like get the exact card in your library that you want and put into your hand. Like that's, I usually cost three and this is three and, and you get a one, two, you only get aura cards, but if there are enough playable auras, um, you know, and you want to start playing a whole bunch of auras cards, like banishing light is not an aura, unfortunately, but if there are, do end up being enough auras, like Helios Pilgrim can see more play. Um, yeah, there's no hex proof aura, but um, all that glitters, as far as I can think of in standard, off the top of my head, without doing a an aura search, all that glitters is the one that really comes to mind. Um, I don't think Ember Cleave is an aura. I think that's an equipment. Um, but yeah, you, you could get the Vigilance aura to put on Paradise Druid. Sure, yeah, you can do that. S2 Kundo. Getting the brand new Twitch Prime sub. Welcome, welcome. All right, that gets us to... Oh, that's, so that's our 11th sub of the day. Didn't quite update that yet. Yeah, you can grab... Uh, yep, you can grab, like, Luminous Bonds for removal. Um, you know, it's like, do you need the removal? You grab Luminous Bonds. Do you not? You grab all that glitters. Um, you can grab this Heliod's Punishment card, but that card's not any good. We'll talk about that one in just a second. You can get you can get this Flash Aura. I don't know. There's, there's not a lot of, like, great auras, but, I mean, we're talking about you know, not only just draw, you know, it's not just three mana one, you know, if you think about three mana one, two draw a card, that's not the worst thing ever, you know, like you're drawing a card, but this is better than drawing a card because you are being able to search your library for the exact card that you want and put it into your hand. So basically, you know, right away when you had this card, a lot of people said L, but I think it's better than that. So I'm going to go with like a D plus. Um, or maybe a C minus even. A playable build around card. I mean, this this saw standard play last time it was in standard. I'll go D plus. <clears throat> All right, Heliod's punishment. One in a white enchant creature enters the battlefield with four task counters on it. The creature can't attack or block, and it loses all abilities, but then it has tap, you remove a task counter from Heliod's Punishment. Then if it has no task counters on it, destroy Heliod's Punishment. So this is just pacifism, but remove the abilities as well. So that's that's an upgrade over pa pacifism. But then also in four turns, you're it's gonna like you're not gonna have your pacifism anymore. That does not seem like a great card. Um I gave Heliod's Intervention a B plus. We're gonna go with just an L here. But yeah, it does lose does lose all the abilities, which that's pretty cool. Um I mean I, I could see yeah, four four turns is a lot of time. And you know, by then you can have like a wrath and stuff like that. Um I mean I I guess I could see this being played in like a Heliod's Pilgrim kind of stuff. Let's go with like a D minus, actually. I mean, this could be something you could see played. It's it's something I would not be shocked to see on the battlefield of standard kind of thing. 
Um, it depends. It's either three or four turns. It depends if the creature has summoning sickness or not when you play it. But, but yeah, it's not something that... Uh, like, I'm pretty sure just regular old pacifisms and standard, I believe, from, like, the last core set. And I think that for the most part, you probably want that. But it, it matters, like, the loses all abilities. If it the, the reason why this would be played at all is if the it loses all abilities part, like, that clause, if that clause... Like, two, two reasons. One, that clause has to be really valuable for the creatures to lose all abilities. And then two, um, it's an aura that you can search for Heliod's Pilgrim with it. Like, those are, like, the only ways that this is seen play. Uh, Kaya, does Kaya increase because you can deal with escape cards? Slightly. I mean, that's not that's not a very... I don't think you just start putting Kaya in your deck because it can deal with escape cards. I think you need Kaya to do more than that. And then as an added bonus, Kaya can do, deal with escape cards. <clears throat> All right. Um, it can... This can... I mean, if this strips indestructible from gods, that means the gods also a creature, so they have a whole bunch of other stuff out. That's tough. <clears throat> but yes, the god would lose indestructible, yes. Hero of the Pride. One in a white for a 2-2 cat soldier. Whenever you cast a spell that targets Hero of the Pride, creatures you control get plus one, plus zero. So putting an aura on Hero of the Pride, targeting it with a god's willing, you know, putting it in a feather deck, you target Hero of the Pride, all your creatures, including it, get plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Um, that's still, I mean, that's nice. That's a cool bonus. As far as getting up to standard play, I don't, I don't know. If, I don't think we're really there, even, even with that. Like, um, Talking about like the other two mana cards you can play in feather decks and, and everything. I don't, I don't know if we're really there. I think basically for this, you would have to play more of like a go wide plus target your creatures a bunch. So like go wide and go tall deck. And it's kind of hard to have a deck that does both of those. I guess it's J for Jank. Um, but it's kind of a little bit better than just a limited card because that is kind of somewhat valuable. I we'll just go with it. We'll just go with L for limited. That's kind of tough. I don't. I don't even know if that goes in a Bogle's deck. Because you need to put that in a Bogle's deck that wants to go wide. I don't know. I feel like you probably want just a better creature. All right, Hero of the Winds, three and a white for a one-four flyer. Whenever you cast a spell that targets Hero of the Winds, creatures you or creatures you control get plus one plus zero. So same thing. Um, that's kind of that's kind of weird. They have the exact same card basically, but you know, just change the stats, change the mana cost, change the stats. Um, we're gonna go with an L. I mean, this costs four. I mean, it's cool. It's a flyer, but with it costing four, we're gonna go with an L. All right, idyllic tutor, two and a white sorcery. Search your library for an enchantment card. Reveal it. Put it into your hand. Then shuffle your library. Um, of course, this is a this is a much needed reprint for people playing in like commander and stuff like that i saw that this was a pretty expensive card before getting reprinted um but as far as standard i'm not really expect i'm not really uh expecting this to see too much standard play um it could see a little bit you know you, you can definitely have enchantment decks like there are a lot of enchantments i think like the like one of the best things you can do with idyllic tutor or like the the main card in standard right now that makes me feel like um <clears throat> idyllic tutor can see uh, that could see like real play is fires of invention you know like it this goes in like fires of invention is such an important card if you're playing a fires of invention deck this goes and gets you fires of invention puts it into your hand but then also when you're playing fires you can play this as one of your two cards and it's not really like taking up your whole turn kind of thing like a three mana card takes up a lot of mana during like the mid game and you know if you have a fires out you can play Id idyllic tutor um you know, go grab like Elspeth Conquers Death if that card's, you know, really necessary or, or you know, go grab whatever you want, want. You know, of course, it does grab the gods. You know, the gods are enchantments and things like that. But still, even with even like with the cool things you can grab, like gods and, and some of these sagas, like there's some there's some pretty cool sagas to grab. Even that I wouldn't really think Idyllic Tutor is that great. But because of Fires of Invention, 
um, and how this pairs with fires of invention, then then I could certainly see this start uh, seeing a lot more play. So as far as a grade here, I think I'm going to go with a C. I think this is kind of a, a classic C, uh, fringe standard sideboard, or sorry, a fringe standard card used as filler for certain decks, or a playable build around card. You can kind of build around idyllic tutor and stuff. So I think this is going to be a C. Uh, correct. The order, the order that we're going is up here. White is our first color. So yeah, we're on card number twenty-five right now. <clears throat> Indomitable will. I mean, this is just going to be an L. I mean, one into white enchantment aura flash enchant creature gets plus one plus two. That's that's like a limit. That's a good limited trick. That's not really a standard card. I guess we can we can move forward with some of these L's a little faster. Karametra's blessing. A, white, a one mana white instant. Target creature gets plus two plus two until end of turn. If it's an enchanted creature or an enchantment creature, it also gains hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. I could see Karametra's Blessing seeing a little bit of play. Like one mana cards, like that's where you're talking. You're talking like, um, you're talking standard playable when you got one mana instant. You know, like that's that's standard play. Like that's what you want for your instants. You want a one mana instant. So if you're, if you got a one mana instant, they can, they can do some stuff. You know, it can, uh, you know, help you in combat that, you know, helps you win a combat by plus two, plus two. Um, and like, that's nice, you know, help you survive a burn spell. But then if you have an enchant, if you put it in a deck with a good amount of enchantment creatures or you're enchanting other creatures, give it hex proof and indestructible. Like that's, that's not bad. It's not bad at all. So what are we going with here? I think, um, maybe like a D a card you'll see rarely in standard, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's not the worst. Yeah, and it goes in like a feather deck. I mean, it definitely goes in a feather deck. Um, most likely, like you'd have to, you'd need to play like enchantments in the feather deck also, or like, you know, for it to be better than some of the, because red has like give the creature plus three plus two kind of thing. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's not it's not as it's not as good as Blossoming Defense, but yes, it, it has higher upside. Or like, you know, it, it can basically be better than Blossoming Defense. But, you know, it makes your um, enchantment creature survive a Wrath effect. So that's really cool with the Indestructible. All right, Laguna Band Storyteller. Three and a white, three, four. Whenever Laguna Band Storyteller enters the battlefield, you may put target enchantment card from your graveyard on top of your library. If you do, you gain a life equal to its CMC. I think for four mana, we can be doing better stuff in standard. I'm going to go ahead and give this an L. All right, Leonin of the Lost Pride. One and a white, three, one. When Leonin of the Lost Pride dies, exile target card from an opponent's graveyard. I mean, the only way to play this really is if you if we want Cat Tribal. I think that's where we're, we're playing this is in Cat Tribal. Um, besides Cat Tribal, I don't think that we're going to really be able to play Lean In of the Lost Pride. But, yeah, limited. Good old card for limited there. So we'll give this an L. Same with our next card, 3-mana 2-4, Nyxborn Courser. Um, looks like Courser got quite a downgrade. It was turned into white and also has no abilities anymore. So that's not cool. I liked Courser. Four Courser. All right, Omen of the Sun. Two and a white enchantment with flash. When Omen of the Sun enters the battlefield, create two one one human soldier creatures tokens. And you get to gain two life. And then it has two and a white sacrifice omen of the sun at scry two. So every single color has one of these omens that are um, an enchantment with flash, and then you get to I guess I don't know. I can't I guess I don't know if every single one of them has flash, but um, you know, enchantment that you get to play that has an, a, a spell-like ability that's usually like an incinner sorcery, and then you pay two and a white to sacrifice it and scry. Um, yeah, if you're playing a deck that's going wide, this is nice, you know, getting two one ones, but we are talking two one ones for three. This is just costs a lot of mana. Um, you know, sure, you get to gain two life also. Um, and yeah, I guess you get the, the devotion, like the one devotion and it's an enchantment for that kind of stuff. But I, I don't really expect Omen of the Sun to see very much play. I mean, I think 
I think overall this is a worse card than Raise the Alarm. I think that uh, costing one less mana for getting your two one ones is more valuable than uh, costing an extra mana. You get to gain two life, and then you can also sacrifice the enchantment to scry. I, I think that Raise the Alarm is better. So it's like, do you want more Raise the Alarms um, in a deck? Like you'd have to be a you know a pretty token heavy deck, want to be going wide, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not expecting. Uh, yeah, I'm not expecting this to, to see really much play at all. Um, but it's not, it's not unplayable. Let's go, let's go with the, let's go with the D minus. But I mean, this it's basically as close to an L as we can have. Phalanx Tactics. Uh... One in a white instant, target creature you control gets plus two, plus one until end of turn. Each other creature you control gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Okay, so basically, this is just all your, you know, two mana instant, all your creatures get plus one, plus one, and then another creature gets an additional plus one. But then it's also, so therefore, it's kind of a little worse because, you know, like if they have an instant speed removal to kill the creature that you're targeting, then this will fizzle. Are we really playing a, a two mana instant speed anthem effect that's just the singular anthem? Probably not. Um, but yeah, when, when you're going wide, there's just much better finishers. Like I, wouldn't, I don't think you'd ever really play this over Unbreakable Formation. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I think this is just an L. I, I don't think this is... I mean, I guess... I mean, in like a feather deck, because it is you do get to rebuy it. I guess that's like the one thing. Um, hey, cube mats. It's not not a very good card for standard. You know, probably pretty great for limited, but yeah, formation is awesome. Yeah, I don't even, I don't know if it really like two mana in feather is a lot of mana. So. I'm going to go with an L. Pious Wayfarer. Uh, one white, one two. Constellation, whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, target creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Um, one mana cards are pretty valuable, as we've seen in like a mono white formation deck that, that just spews out a whole lot of one drops. So this is a one drop with an ability, and it's a one two, but I don't think this ability is good enough to see have it see play over any of the other current one drops in that kind of deck. And in an enchantment heavy deck, I don't think you put a one mana one two in your deck to make your enchantment theme better. So we're gonna just go ahead and give this an L as well. Man, we have not had a, a playable card in a long time. <laughs> All right, Reverent Hoplite. Four and a white, one, two. Yeah, so, you, okay, so you want to play Pious Wherefore in, like, an aggro deck with the enchantment creatures, with these things, with Evangel, Daxos, Eidolon. I mean, it's still worth playing a one-mana one-two. We probably just play a better card. Even with a, a few extra little bonuses, we probably just play a better card. All right, Reverent Hoplite, four and a white, one, two. That's not good. <laughs> but whenever Reverend Hoplite enters the battlefield, you create a number of 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature tokens equal to your devotion to white. Okay. So it, it always comes along with an extra 1-1. One, one. So, you know, it, at the very, very worst, you're paying 5 mana for a 1-2 and a 1-1. One, one. That's really bad. But if you can have 5-6-7 devotion for white, you start bringing along 5-6-7 creatures. Um... I mean, if we think about standard for a card like this, you can kind of compare it to like Tristani Discordant. Tristani is bring, is a one four that brings along two one ones, but then also anthems your whole squad, so it makes those two one ones into two twos, and then any other creatures you have in play also get anthemed. And when you kind of compare Reverend Hotlight to that, Reverend Hoplite looks not so good. I mean, it's it's going to be pretty difficult to have a huge devotion. Um, to really make this worth it. Um, yeah, if you could give them haste somehow, um, you know, you pair this with like, I don't know, I guess it'd be like Sarkin 
to give him haste. Okay, yeah, you pair, you have divine visitation in place, then you make him four fours. I mean, that's just the same thing as Tristani Discordant. You can already do that in standard. I'm just giving this an L. I don't think this is going to see any standard play. Revoke Existence, one and a white sorcery, exile, target, artifact, or enchantment. All right, so just an upgrade over Disenchant. Um, well, kind of upgrade. Upgrade in the fact that you get to exile, but this is a sorcery, not an instant speed card. Disenchant being an instant is really, really nice. However, exiling enchantments is going to be important if people are playing the gods, because the gods are enchantments that are indestructible. And so this is a, just a really nice answer to have in a sideboard for decks that, that are playing a lot of gods. Um, but then, you know, you can also have it exile. Uh, you know, this is also just a great card against like a Cauldron Familiar deck also. So this just seems like a pretty solid um, sideboard card. Uh, yeah. So let's see. So probably like a, a B, you know, like a moderately played sideboard card. I don't think you just like jam a ton of these in your sideboard always. I mean, it's it's a it's a card that's a very useful sideboard card if the metagame is in a certain spot. Um, like I said, if if like the Cauldron Familiar decks are big and if gods are big, then this is a very useful sideboard card. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give this a B. You play Disenchant main decks, you'll put this in instead. There you go. Okay. But I'll give it a B. All right, Rumb Rumbling Sentry, 3 wh white, white, 3 6. Whenever it enters the battlefield, scry 1. All right, so would we rather have a. Would we rather have Rumbling Sentry? We play it, we get to scry 1. Or for the same mana cost and stats, we can have God Eternal Oketra. That doesn't have any ETB effect, so that's worse than scrying 1. But, you know, whenever you cast a creature, you get 4 4s and. Whenever it dies, you put it back into your deck. Probably want God Eternal Ketra. Hey, thanks, Yud. Yeah, trip went very well. All right, so we'll give it an L. It can survive a Rumcloak Giant. That's true. But, yeah, it's probably not that useful besides that. <clears throat> All right, Sentinel's Eyes. One white for an enchantment aura. Enchant creature gets plus one, plus one, and has Vigilance. And it also has Escape. For white, exile two other cards from your graveyard. So again, this this would have to be some really aura matters deck, you know, and, and everything. Um, you know, like, yeah, it's a vigilant card you can put on Paradise Druid, I guess. And then, you know, you start loading up your Paradise Druid. But, I mean, it, that doesn't really seem like a, a great standard strategy. But that would be the kind of deck that you could possibly play this in. Um yeah, it's like another jank combo. I'm just gonna give it an L though, because I don't think it could really. I don't think this can really see a little bit of play in other decks as well. So we're just gonna go with an L. Shatter the sky. Two white white sorcery. Each player who controls a creature with power four or greater draws a card. Then destroy all creatures. So we get four mana. Destroy all creatures. Um. That's really good. That's really good. And that's not a card I like to see. I like creatures. I don't like... I'm not a big fan of four mana wraths. I like creatures more. Um, yeah, so it is a board wipe. So yeah, I mean, this is certainly at least a B. Now this is... If you're playing you know, like control decks, you know, like your classic like blue-white control that now gets, it gets a really good four mana sweeper. You don't have to play black for Kaya's Wrath. The thing is, is, is your opponents are going to be drawing a card, you know... It, a good amount of the time not not all the time maybe not even half the time i don't know how much of the time but you know your opponents will be drawing cards if they have their large creatures in play they are destroying as well um as far as playing this proactively like the obvious thing is is gideon yeah um i guess i'm not sure with i don't know exactly what that Terran Terranica card does Terranica. i don't know however you pronounce that um and tap another target creature. That creature gains base power, toughness 4 4, and gains indestructible. Mm. I mean, you're still just destroying your Terra Nika. But yeah, like with Gideon, this works very well with Gideon. Um, you get to draw a card, you destroy all the other creatures, your Gideon stays around. Um, this works well with, with gods. 
know, because your gods are indestructible, they're bigger. So like if you can, if you have like a deck with like a, other permanents, like enchantments and stuff, they can turn on the devotion for your gods, make them creatures. So you get to draw cards. It works well there. But as far as in a control deck, it's a little, it's a downside as being just a regular four mana wrath. <clears throat> um, and of course, Gideon, yeah, Gideon can make another creature indestructible. Like if you have a Gideon in play, you can tick up on Gideon, make another creature indestructible, then cast this and you get to save two creatures. Um, is, I think this card's prop, I think this card is worse overall uh than just two white white destroy all creatures i think that that would be more powerful for because i think that the card the people that usually want to destroy all creatures are people that are usually not playing creatures so i think that while we, t we talked about situations where it can be better for you for the most part people that want this card are people with control decks and they would rather just have two white white destroy all creatures and so i think that two white white destroy all creatures would probably see more play than this will end up seeing but I could be wrong about that. But yeah, well, Wrath, Wrath of God also is bury all creatures, not destroy all creatures. It it deals with... I mean, it's not going to be re reprinted because regeneration's not a thing. Um, I kind of think this is just a B, honestly. I think there's a lot of times that people would rather play Time Wipe than play this, even. Um, we've seen how, how good Time Wipe is of like picking creatures back up and everything like that. Um, but I think this is kind of just like, like Rome Cloak Giant, you know, like Rome Cloak Giant. I think this is better than Rome Cloak Giant, I guess. So I guess Rome Cloak Giant we had is a B. I guess, I think this is better. So I guess we're going to go with a B plus or A minus. I'll just go A minus. Because, you know, you will be having your aggro opponent draw cards a good amount of the time with this card also. But it is pretty awesome. Maybe it should just be an A. I mean, Kai's Wrath, I gave an A. This doesn't have the... It's a lot easier to cast than Kai's Wrath. But, so maybe we should just give this an A. So basically, in... <clears throat> yeah, like I gave Kai's Wrath an A. Um... Because this has like some upside effects too. So maybe I guess hmm. I don't know. I don't know. If there's like a huge difference between a a minus that kind of stuff. All right, I'm gonna finish up with a minus. All right, Sunmare Pegasus three white two three flying and pay two give it vigilance and life link. It is a Pegasus. You can put it with that other Pegasus. But you shouldn't. I'm going to just give this an L. All right. Terranica. Maybe Terranica. I don't know. If anybody has a pronunciation they, that they know is correct, let me know in the chat. A Crowan Veteran. All right. Three white white for a 3-3 three, three Vigilance. So I like that. So three mana, 3-3 three, three Vigilance. Legendary creature. I like all those stats. Pretty good stats. Um, whenever... Uh, um, notifications were turned off. What notifications were turned off? What do you mean? Um, but yeah, whenever whenever this attacks, untap another target creature you control and tell it to turn that creature has base power, toughness four four, and gains indestructible. That's pretty awesome. So you know you get to play this with, you know, like Hero of Precinct One, for example. You know, I'm just using that as an example, but like basically a, a two mana card the that. You know, usually wouldn't be able to attack, you know, like a, a cruel celebrant, um, you know, like anything like that, that you know, like a, a creature like that, that usually isn't doing a whole lot of attacking and blocking. You get to attack with it with the Terranica as well. Um, uh, oh, OK, I got you, Rex. I got you. Um, you get to attack with it as well. You get to turn that into a four four. So it, it hits very hard, but then it also is indestructible. So yeah, I like this card a lot. Now it is a legendary creature, so you don't get to play it a lot. You know, like I don't know if like four copies if you're really thrown in decks because it is a legendary creature. But you know, it does it is definitely a good uh devotion enabler. That's also another strength of it. Um 33 is good stats with like uh Bone Crusher Giant being everywhere. It's good to have that third toughness for sure. Um, you know, get out of Bone Crusher Giant range and you know it 
trades with the back half of Bone Crusher Giant, I guess. But you know, and it has Vigilant, so you don't have to worry about. Um, you know, you can play defense with it also because it has Vigilance, and whenever you attack with it, whatever creature you attack with gets untapped. So even if the other creature doesn't have Vigilance, it can stay back on defense as well. It's just a pretty good card, pretty good uh, card in combat and everything like that. Um, yeah, it does work really well with with um, Krenko. Yeah, that's that's true. So yeah, as far as grading scale, I mean, I don't think it's an A. I mean, it's not like Murderous Rider, Bone Crusher, Giant. Like those, are, like A's are like four ofs in a lot of different decks. So this isn't an A. Um, I feel like this is more of like a, a B, like a you know, like a Foul Meyer Knight, Torbran type thing. You know, kind of more of like the Torbran level. Like it's a good card, but I don't. Yeah. So like, let's go with a B here. Um, but yeah, nice, nice, solid card. All right, two more. We got uh, Transcendent Envoy, one white for a one-two flyer. Aura spells you cost cast one. <laughs> aura spells you cast cost one less to cast. Tongue Twister. So yeah, two mana, one-two flyer. I mean, you know, of course, flyer like uh, like Azorius flyers can be an archetype. Doesn't seem like we're getting much um, upgrades for Azorius flyers, at least in white. Maybe there is in blue. Um, but yeah, it's another aura matters card. I don't, I don't love it. Um, I mean, I guess I think we're, I think we're on like the D level, also. Like maybe you see the C's play, but probably not. I'm gonna go ahead and give Transcendent Envoy a D, and then Triumphant Surge three and a white instant destroy target creature with power four or greater. You gain three life. Um, too expensive for standard, but that can be a limited card. All right, so that's so that's white. Um, so kind of going through our top five cards in white, uh, the five cards that we gave the highest rating to. Um, looks like we have three cards with an A or better rating and three B pluses, or two. Yeah, yeah, and two B pluses. So our so our two B pluses. So our top five cards. I think we're gonna go with Banishing Light. Number five, Heliod's Invention, number four. Those cards were both B pluses. And then we had three A minuses. So those two are three A minuses. We had um, Shatter the Sky. And then the two big ones, Heliod, Sun Crowned, and Elspeth, Sun's Nemesis. So those are our, our top five cards in white. Those are for, for standard. Um, okay. All right. So we're going to be going on to the other colors. As you can see, the order at the top, it's kind of that way for you. Uh, let's see. How do you how do you point on here? That way. There we go. That way. Um, we'll, we'll be going on to blue next. Those of y'all watching on YouTube, leave those comments. Let me know what, what you think of the uh, different cards we rated. What did I underrate? What did I overrate? All that kind of stuff. You know, like, let me know. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's it here for white. So thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you for blue. We'll see you for the next video.